I believe we are now live. So hello and welcome back to UNIX European Spaces of Culture Conference, taking EU cultural relations to the next level. Over the next hour and 15 minutes, this sync session will take a closer look at how cultural relations can create safe spaces for intercultural dialogue and creativity, instrumental in enhancing cultural rights and freedom of expression as fundamental rights. My name is Rosanna. I work for the British Council as Culture and Development Lead, and I'll be your moderator for today. What can cultural relations do to increase the awareness of the need to act against climate change? How can we steer towards a more prominent role of cultural relations in the EU's Green New Deal? both internal and external, supporting policymakers to include culture in green policies and programmes? And how do the projects of European spaces of culture contribute to the new European Bauhaus initiative and to the achievement of the UN Sustainable Development Goals? So I am joined today by a brilliant panel of speakers from different angles, both policy and practice. And I'll just invite each of them to give a short introduction to themselves and their organisations and let us know where they're joining us from. So if I could come to Reis first, Reis de Vries from London School of Economics. Yes, hello, um, Reis de Vries, uh, European Institute, London School of Economics, and uh, previously a board member of the European Cultural Foundation and several other activities. And I'm joining you from The Hague in Holland. Great, thank you. Ayeta. Um, hello, my name is Ayeta Anwangusa. I'm the Executive Director of Culture and Development East Africa, uh, based in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. And I'm also uh, an expert uh, for the 2005 UNESCO Convention. Thank you. Thanks, Ayeta. Henry. <clears throat> Hello, I'm, my name is Henry McGee. I'm a museum consultant based in the UK. I, I run a consultancy called Curating Tomorrow. Uh, I'm also a member of the, the ICOM Sustainability Working Group. Uh, and I'm from, I, I'm here in, in Liverpool in, in the UK. Thank you. Thank you. And Christian. Hello, I'm Christian. I'm tuning in from Munich and I am the co-founder of Rehab Republic, an environmental NGO based in Munich. And I also work as part of a freelance collective helping NGOs and social businesses with their marketing and communications. Great, thank you very much. And we're delighted to have you all here today with us. So I have a series of questions for you um, on this topic, and I'm gonna start with Hayes. Um, You recently completed a piece of research for IFA on the cultural dimension of sustainable development and the opportunities for national cultural institutes. So if you could give us a bit of an overview of that, uh, the main points and recommendations from that piece of research and what the concerns are for the role of the cultural sector and in particular cultural relations. Right, well, thank you, thank you very much. Um, uh, IFA, the, the German Institute for International Cultural Relations asked me to write a paper on um, the role of the European Union in promoting culture as part of the global agenda for sustainable development, the sustainable development goals. So we, we did a bit of a, uh, a survey, find, tried to find out what the national cultural institutes of the member states were doing. And the, the picture was a varied one. Um, I think it's fair to say that a number uh, of national cultural institutes are really far ahead. Um, but others considerably less so. Um, so a lot of awareness still needs to be raised, and this conference is a great example of that, about the potential for culture in global sustainable development. But in terms of the front runners, I could cite the Danish Cultural Institute, for example, uh, which has officially adopted a policy to focus its work uh, along the different sustainable development goals. So to clearly identify which of their projects contributes to global economic development or environmental uh, improvements or gender equality and the like. Um, then there are some cultural institutes who occasionally uh, do this uh, link with the sustainable development goals. For example, uh, the Italian Cultural Institute um, uh, in um, uh, Turkey 
has been very active in promoting films about sustainability um, to attract uh, a discussion at local level. Then there's a third group of cultural institutes which um, have not yet embraced the SDGs as part of policy, but are working on it, um, such as the Goethe Institute. And there are others like the British Council, which have looked at their existing portfolio to see how the cultural projects they currently run correspond with the SDGs, but they have not yet decided to actually focus on them. So that's roughly the picture. But on balance, I think the development is for a greater focus on the potential of culture for global sustainable development. Thank you. And it's a very useful overview for our audience to hear how different European national cultural institutes are looking at the SDGs and starting to engage. So I'm going to move on to Ayeta, who's joining us from Dar es Salaam. Um, can you share a bit more with us about how international partnerships are relevant to cultural collaboration in and with East Africa? And where do you find the SDGs come into this context? I think you're on mute. If you could unmute for us, that would be great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rosanna, uh, for this opportunity to share my thoughts. Uh, can I share my screen at this moment? Yeah, that would be great if you are able to share your screen. Um, well, I would like to begin by uh, anchoring this uh, conversation within uh, the UNESCO uh, convention, the 2005 convention uh, that promotes the, the diversity of cultural expression uh, because it is uh, this instrument that highlights the role of the international cultural cooperation, uh, but also, you know, within this goal, um, it also, you know, within this convention, there is a goal that uh, highlights uh, the need to integrate culture in sustainable development goals. Uh, and there are two goals actually that are highlighted. Uh, one is around decent work and economic growth, and the other on uh, partnerships for growth. But more specifically, in terms of international cooperation, uh, is uh, you know ideas around strategies that support diverse cultural expressions and also programs around you know cultural sectors in the, the development sector. Um, Are you able to share your screen just in slideshow view to help our viewers see the, the slides more easily? Thank you. Like that. Perfect. Thanks a lot. Yeah. So I'll go directly and talk about the, the global, you know, South-North relations. So, you know, while, you know, most strategies, of course, within the, the UNESCO Convention are about, you know, promoting uh, North-South uh, relations in terms of uh, funding, we see, of course, there is uh, inequity in terms of, uh, you know, funding dynamics and, uh, at, but however, there is another goal within the convention that at, at least tries to balance the relationship between, you know, the North-South and the South, uh, South, uh, South cultural relations, because it's talking about achieving a balanced flow of cultural goods and services. Uh, nevertheless, even if there is such a goal, there are still some uh, structural barriers and some of these barriers are associated uh, to the lack of uh, bilateral treaties between countries, for example, between Tanzania and, and, and the, the EU, you know, that uh, focus on, for example, promoting cultural, uh, creative and cultural think tanks or universities uh, that can enhance these uh, uh, cultural relationships or you know, relations with uh, the, the global north. Of course, at multilateral level, we have the SCP, and the EU partnership that is more specific uh, to audiovisual production and distribution in the, uh, in the and the and the culture and creative industries. Uh, we see the especially now with COVID nineteen, the digital space providing an opportunity for uh, collaboration between the global south and north. But they still need you know for to build trust uh, between you know parties in different uh, spheres of the globe. 
so that they can now begin talking about digital collaboration. I would like to specifically talk about uh, this, uh, SDGs and climate change, uh, because this is uh, directly connected with the topic of today. Uh, so we see that uh, although the culture is not recognized as a goal uh, within the SDGs, uh, UNESCO has tried to make those connections uh, to show the, the link between you know, culture and sustainable cities, the environment and uh, uh, sustainable consumption and production. Uh, however, uh, we see that uh, to date there's this limited you know, efforts uh, you know, to showcase uh, this integration of culture within global science and response. Uh, and UNESCO and e-commerce and also the International Panel on Climate Change suggests that uh, the link, uh, there's need to assess the link between culture, heritage and climate change, uh, which can catalyze uh, ideas for new projects, uh, uh, research, publications around heritage and climate change uh, that can bring both uh, stakeholders from the global south and the north. However, uh, while we are talking about the sustainable development goals, I think there is need to point out that uh, the sustainable development goals does not necessarily mean sustainability. And uh, so it may be a good thing that uh, culture is not a goal within the sustainable development goals because it provides an opportunity for diverse you know, uh, perspectives on sustainability that are not aligned to neoliberal thinking. And so we can get ideas from indigenous communities or even social impact interventions from the global south. And also um, it provides an opportunity for creative hubs in the south and European cultural spaces to innovate around sustainability outside the current sustainable development framework. Uh, this is because as I mentioned earlier, uh, even if there are goals that connect uh, that have measured culture recording in progress their their indicators are not uh, well elaborated oh sorry about that i was trying to save i'll do that again <laughs> uh, in addition i think this is quite uh, critical we we see that within ac academic and, and practice discussion there is the discussion on the role of culture in sustainability uh, and see culture as a pillar on its own, uh, the role of culture as playing a mediating role in sustainability. But there's a limited discussion, especially in the global south, about you know, uh, sustainability being embedded in culture. And so this could also form an area for research for uh, south-north uh, cultural relations and uh, culture, uh, relations exploration. And now I'd like to just go specific to some examples, especially around our work and why I feel that it's important for international partnerships uh, uh, for cul to cultural collaborations. And I, I'll pick uh, an example uh, from the European Green Deal that talks about boosting efficient use of resources uh, by moving to clean and a circular economy. And I'll share that example of a project that my organization is working on, which is called Dar es Salaam, the Kosana village, where we, are, we plan to establish a hub, an eco hub and an eco hotel. Uh, and the idea here, what we feel that international part, uh, collaboration can support us is in the transfer of technical knowledge uh, on uh, issues around sustainable building and construction uh, clean energy and uh, ideas of uh, sustainable consumption, especially the circular economy. And also within the hub, we have a strong emphasis on uh, research. So opportunities for joint research around creative economy and climate change uh, for both Sibera uh, uh, and also EU, EU cultural spaces. The other example uh, is around, you know, restoring the biodiversity, you know, of uh, of, uh, of the ecosystem in uh, Tanzania, which is part of the East African uh, coastal ecosystem. We've done a pilot project with support from uh, climate, Purpose Climate uh, Lab 
that supported us to do our campaigns, uh, focusing on, uh, you know, creating awareness that the, you know, the, the plants that we see around us are actually not native to our ecosystem and actually identify what is native because it has a very uh, pivotal role in uh, balancing the ecosystem. So with this, we feel that through international partnerships, we can scale up uh, this uh, intervention so that it can impact on a larger area, not just in Tanzania, but from Kenya up to Mozambique, uh, which is uh, the coastal ecosystem that has uh, unique uh, plants and native uh, um, ecosystem that is disappearing. Uh, finally, I'd like to talk about how I see the South-North collaborations uh, uh, how I see them adding to policy making in sustainable development and wide world. Uh, I'll uh, focus on, for example, cities and local government uh, authorities. And here I'll speak about the uh, African cultural capitals and the European capital, uh, cultural capitals. I think last year we already began a conversation on how we could collaborate. And uh, that was quite uh, interrupted by the COVID-19. But some of the issues here that could be highlighted is the role of artists as pu public communicators uh, uh, in climate change science in cities, but also cultural research uh, aimed at reclaiming the native plant ecosystem for cultural capitals. Uh, the other area uh, that I feel you know, that can contribute to policy making is on the urban construction. And uh, here uh, I see uh, an opportunity for collaborative architectural design that balances cultural and environmental values that provide evidence for green building laws and regulations. Because as I speak now in Tanzania, we still don't have a, a building code that speaks to green building and that has an impact on climate change. And then uh, the idea of a circular economy, uh, that is what our hub is focusing on, uh, trying to recycle even the desks that we use. We use uh, products, for example, from old boats, dows, and turn them into uh, tables for work. So here's another area whereby we'd like to you know, research on providing evidence that promotes sustainable consumption and pro uh, production practice and also highlighting the, highlighting the fact that cu of culture and sustainability and not the other two that are actually highlighted in the SDGs. And then finally, uh, creative hubs, you know, you know, as think tanks, you know, the collaboration between think tanks in, in uh, the South and the North, you know, translating knowledge from and about culture and heritage for climate uh, science and policy. Uh, thank you for your attention and uh, I hope I'm not use too much time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ayeta. Um, that was a really concrete examples of things that can happen, things that can change for the better, and also seeing culture as the mediator to sustainability in different ways. So thanks for sharing those examples with us today. Um, I'm going to come next to Henry, who um, in his work has done a lot of research um, and has come up with really concrete ways as well of connecting culture and heritage to the fight against global climate change. So um, what do you feel is the role and responsibility of culture and creativity um, in reaching the SDGs? And where is the added value of European collaboration in this respect? Why is it important that cultural relations attunes its work to the effects of climate change? Okay, thank you. I'm just having a problem with my um, screen share. Here we go. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you for the for the uh, for the opportunity to to talk today. Um, so I, I just thought I would start with this very familiar image that we all have of the of the the icons for the sustainable development goals, and just to say really about, of course, it is very true that a picture saves a thousand words, 
if we think about these um, policies and agendas, which have many of them have been around for, for perhaps 30 or more years, but they just don't reach practitioners. If we were to take the example of the, of the Framework Convention on Climate Change from 1992, it's very specific about the importance of participation and education and public awareness. But for whatever reason, these documents, although they're not such huge documents, they just don't make it into practice. The original framework convention is, is probably less than 30 pages. The same could be, could be said of the Paris Agreement. But people tend, let's be honest, not to read these things. So in the same way that I've got this image of the, of the SDGs behind me, they give you a, people can learn very quickly what one another values. It's pretty, if you, if you see that, it's, it can be pretty clear. I think the SDGs are really important. I've got them hanging up in my house. But we also have to acknowledge that at the end of the day, however attractive the image is, it's just an image. The thing that brings these things to life is people. And in particularly when we're talking about multi-stakeholder dialogue and action, that's people in whatever context they're in, whatever groups they're in. And one of the great um, benefits, I think, of the SDGs, the way that they're articulated is it has to be, they're, they're very attractive, but they're also a bit abstract. They make you ask, well, what is this about? You know, what has this got to do with me? Or they help people find one another and think, oh, actually, I'm interested in that as well. Okay, you're interested as well. That's fantastic. Let's do something together. That is culture. And so I've just got a few slides to go through. So, of course, it's quite easy to think from the cultural sector Oh, of course, we relate to the, the right to participate in cultural life. Human rights, in the same way with the SDGs, they're all connected with one another. We can't just think of ourselves in a box that the cultural sector is only concerned with cultural rights. Surely the, the cultural sector is concerned with all rights because they're, they're connected. Um, so just to take some examples, why should, why, should, why should the cultural sector care about climate change or why should people care about climate change well, climate change relates to many of our human rights. It's a dreadful threat multiplier. You know, you obviously, it's just, just a list. I'm not going not gonna to read through them all here. But just to say that we, just to, re, to repeat that, actually, that we can't just think of the cultural sector as just being interested in cultural things. Because also, there's a difference between the right to, take, to participate in cultural life and the cultural sector. Those two things are not exactly the same thing. And this is, this is a quote from the, from the Blunt, Bruntland report, not the, not the definition of sustainable development, but this, this is one of my favorite quotes, that the integrated and interdependent nature of the new challenges and issues that face us today contrast sharply with the nature of institutions that exist. They tend to be independent, fragmented, and working to relatively narrow mandates with closed decision processes. The real world of interlocked economic and ecological systems will not change. The policies and institutions concerned must. And I love that quote, because when we talk about policies and institutions, again, we're talking about relationships, we're talking about people, talking about community and decision-making and society. So just to, if I've not made that point clearly enough yet, it's that, well, the cultural sector should support people to take part in climate action because everyone has a right to know how climate change is going to impact upon them and their lives and their families and their friends and their property. And everyone has the right to participate in climate action. So if we acknowledge that cultural institutions have the potential, at least, to empower people to understand and to care about and to have skills to act on climate change, arguably the biggest threat facing the world today, then surely that means they've got obligations and responsibilities to support them to do so. We also have to, have to acknowledge that the cultural sector is a manifestation of the society we have. If we see inequality and an unsustainable relationship between the economy, society and the environment, we need to change that. We need to find ways to to, to rebalance that. So that means the cultural sector has to also change. We can't just view it as a universal good. So I wrote that, so what I tend to do is I write these, these guides on um, museums and sustainable development issues. And I just 
to highlight here, you can get them for, for free, to highlight that all of these talk about the importance of public participation. Of course, in, in the uh, Agenda 2030, or if we take disaster risk reduction, talks about how do you bring different stakeholders and an all of society approach together to, to reduce disaster risk. From museums and human rights, we can draw on human rights based approaches, which are again, are about being particip participatory and, and empowering. So to say that although these agendas originate from quite different places, well, arguably from slightly different places, cultural participation is, is through all of them. It's, it's in all of them. If we were to, to view again um, Agenda 2030 and the, the, it talks about the, the right to development, which it has to be said is very poorly understood, but is an absolutely fantastic way to think about cultural relations. The Declaration on the Right to Development, which originated from the Global South, from, from Africa, establishes the right of everyone to participate in, con contribute to and enjoy economic, social, cultural and political development in which all human rights and fundamental freedoms are, can be fully realised. And it establishes these important points that, of course, the, the, the participant and beneficiary in, in development is the individual. It's the person, it's a human person. We're all unique, we're all different, but we all matter. Um, it's framed around active, free and meaningful participation. It's not top down. People have to be active participants in the activities that are going to affect them. And people have the right to self-determination. People have a right to shape these programmes. And if we were to think about how the cultural sector generally works, let's be honest, is, is often quite far from that. It's still quite top down. Something is developed, people consume it in different ways. That's, that's not quite this. And so if we were to take um, cultural relations, you could quite easily read cultural relations into all of these SDG targets. I'm not going to go through them all, but it's just to say that cultural relations is hugely important in terms of a lot of these things, how people are involved in decisions, about addressing equality issues, about ensuring that the rights and participation of minorities is, is, is appropriately handled, because that's the only way that people are going to be able to, to claim their rights. And so I would just highlight a couple here um, in, in target 1610, but around uh, from, from Peace, Justice and Strong Institutions, around ensuring public access to information and protecting fundamental freedoms. It's not just about access to information. It's about, um, it's about a culture of human rights and valuing people, which again, we could, we could see in, in these different things. So what I'm trying to say is that we can use cultural institutions and cultural relations to bring these things to life. Cultural relations help us manage the relations and sometimes the competing interests between different groups. And that's how we actually build climate action. Um, and then my final point slide here is around, so what's the added value of collaboration scaling up? You know, we, we, there's not enough time to, you know, for everyone to, you know, do, the, do these things one after another. Also, a sustainable world re relies on people working together. We have to avoid the competitiveness that there can often be in the cultural sector as, as in other sectors. We need to really genuinely want to work together and learn from one another. Um, it's important to say that the future will be more different than we can possibly imagine. So we need to learn how people address challenges in different places because their present might be our tomorrow. We need to really build a strong public mandate for increased political ambition, which holds back lots of development issues, like, let's, let's be honest. We need to ensure that we leave no one behind in a just transition, and that includes leaving no one behind. It's not just about individuals, it's about sectors, it's about cultural institutions. And climate change is going to amplify inequality and tension, let's, let's face it. We have to diffuse that. And I would just like to build on a point that Ayeta made, that um, the Global North can learn an awful lot from the Global South. If we look at a number of the really fantastic developments that there were around rights in the second half of the 20th century, they, they, they originated in the Global South, the right to development, 
Um, so there, there's this new Escazu agreement around environmental defenders in, in South America. And so, so that's, that's my contribution. So thank you. Thank you, Henry. And that's a real call to action, not just to institutions and policymakers, decision makers, but everyone as individuals to understand sustainable development and the impact on their lives and, and how they can be part of the solution. So thank you for sharing that with us. Um, I'll move now to Christian, who I believe will also share some slides. And if you could give us an example of your work in Rehab Republic um, that really shows how international cultural collaboration can achieve these aims and activities. Um, and I think you have an example from the European Spaces of Culture project in Nogun Bata. So I'll pass over to you now. <laughs> Hello, thank you very much, Rosanna. Um, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I can talk about Nogun Batar. Um, I was thinking to uh, take on the path that Henry just, uh, you know, threw over to me, um, talking about the, uh, in the end that it's people you know that need to in different contexts that need to do things differently and and um this is what is our mission with the rehab republic um, is to change the way that environmental issues or sustainability issues are being communicated and we use a lot um cultural for, uh, production or artistic formats um, in order to do that and um, if if you're fine with it, I would like to because our theory is gray. You know, I would like to give you an illustration of of how that works and why artistic forms are so powerful for um, environmental communication or education. Um, so I will just share my screen. And I will try to go the, through that quickly, um, and then I can uh, talk a little bit about Nogon Batar as well. So um, I want you to think about our oceans and uh, the beaches. So imagine you're walking along a beach, uh, and um, what do you think, what waste item would you find most frequently? Think about it for a second. Um, small hint, uh, it is in this picture. But uh, it's not the plastic bottle, it's in the lady's hand, and it is cigarette butts. So we're having a huge environmental problem. So this is a beach in California, the picture, uh, with uh, cigarette butts that are being the number one waste item uh, on the beaches of this world. And what does that have to do with Munich? This is a picture um, from the riverside in Munich. It all looks very neat and clean, but if you take a closer look beneath the surface, you would find cigarette butts uh, everywhere around. And uh, the problem is that with the next heavy rain, they're going to be washed into the river. Each cigarette butt contaminates around 40 liters of water. And um, they're, either they're going to be eaten by animals at one point, or they make all their way to the Black Sea, and they might eventually end up um, on a beach, as we just saw before. And this is not just happening in Munich, this is happening all around the world. So really here, riversides are the root of the problem, people throwing away their cigarette, toxic cigarette butts. So we were thinking, uh, how can we tell people not to throw their cigarette butts on the ground in a positive way that uh, resonates with them? And we came up with a project called Mulli Vanilli. So imagine you're walking along uh, the riverside on a Saturday afternoon, and you come across this pink illuminated box and there is music coming out from inside, apparently live music. So you would get very curious um, to see what's happening inside but because you can't uh, look inside. And there is Andy, our bouncer, and he wouldn't let you in unless you had a ticket. Uh, so how would you get the ticket? You would have to bend down to the grass and pick up cigarette butts and uh, bottle caps from the, uh, from the grass. And um, to most people, that was a very surprising moment because you don't even have to walk one step. You just bow down and you can pick up a handful of um, cigarette butts and bottle caps. Then you would throw them into the waste bin that is also measuring and showing how much water we have collectively saved by that time. And uh, then you would get in. Now, I'm sure you're curious uh, to know what happened inside. And uh, there is a video, but unfortunately today, time is very tight, so we can't watch the video. 
but I brought a picture um, from later at night. So inside um, there was a musician and people basically as a reward for picking up waste uh, could wish for uh, songs from that musician. So it was kind of a giant walkable jukebox. And um, you can also see me in the background. Um, so that was also the point where we uh, told people why we were doing all that and what is the problem with cigarette butts on the ground. Um, so now why, why do we come up with all this art installation and the music, you know, to just tell people a very simple message, not to throw cigarette butts on the ground. And that is uh, rooted in, in environmental psychology because we can't just tell people what to do if we want uh, a message to stick in their heads and to resonate with them. Um, uh, we need a few uh, basic ingredients. And this is a message that has to be simple, uh, specific, unexpected in a way, some elements of surprise, um, emotions involved. Uh, it helps if it's in a social setting and if people interact physically with the problem at hand. Um, it's not necessary that all those six ingredients are, are fulfilled, but it's uh, the more the better. So basically what we're doing is designing a, a sticky vehicle around our message to transport uh, the message in. And two of the best uh, sticky vehicles are either personal experiences, what we just saw, or storytelling, which makes people live through the personal experience of a character. It's also a great tool. Um, and now we go back full circle to the uh, to cultural production and artistic formats, because that is basically what they do. They help us to create experiences uh, or to tell stories. And of course, also they attract people uh, visually or with music. Um, so they are a powerful tool for, um, for environmental education or sustainability education. And um, now the conclusion could be art is a great tool for raising uh, awareness for sustainability issues. And while this is true, it's also the main point of why we want to change environmental communication, because the problem here is that raising awareness um, is not the ultimate goal, because the ultimate goal is behavior change. We need people to change their behavior. And uh, being aware of a problem is only one factor of influencing our behavior and uh, of defining whether we engage in a certain behavior or in the alternative behavior. Um, and it's in, in a lot of the environmental problems uh, today, it's not the most important factor. There are other more important factors. Um, and to illustrate that, I would like to go back to the example of the pink uh, jukebox. So imagine you, you had that experience on one weekend and then two weeks later, you would be on the riverside again, smoking your cigarette and you finish a cigarette and you remember uh, what happened in the pink box. And you remember that you, you don't want to throw away your cigarette, but you just don't know what to do because there are no uh, waste bins anywhere close. So you could carry a cigarette in your hand for a few kilometers. You could put it in your, in your pocket, which is disgusting because your trousers are going to stink. So really being aware of the problem is, uh, is not the full story. It doesn't end here. Um, we need to find out uh, what is causing the behavior of people and where do we have leverage to change. So what we did was um, handing out small portable ashtrays. You can see them here also, one uh, with me, um, where people could put in their cigarette butts and take them all the way to the next waste bin, thereby making, uh, in, uh, enabling them to engage in the new behavior. So. Um, uh, environmental communication needs to do more than just raising awareness and delivering information and the cultural production, the arts are a powerful tool uh, to help us do that and to engage with people in a profound way. And um, this, you asked about the inter international collaboration. Um, at the moment, we, we would certainly love to do more international collaboration. At the moment, most of our work is being done locally in, uh, in Germany. And um, we do already help other organizations in Germany to develop uh, strategies for communication. Um, but, but yeah, the challenges we're tackling are global. So uh, it, we would be delighted to uh, do more international collaboration and engage uh, to inspire each other, as we did with uh, the UNIC program uh, Nogombatra uh, Eco, Eco Art Festival.
So um, we heard already about that earlier today. And um, you can see here the, the picture of the, the Gur districts where a large population of people in, in Ulaanbaatar live in the yurts, you know, the Mongolian type of tents that um, their parents or their grandparents or even themselves still lived in a nomad life uh, a few decades ago. And they moved into the city. And um, this is where most of the, uh, probably most of the air pollution in Ulaanbaatar is caused because of he uh, heating with coal. And it definitely is the place where uh, people suffer most from, from the air pollution. So it is also the place where environmental education should go. And it's also a place where, um, where uh, artistic formats would be needed a lot because you see it's, um, well, it's quite grayish, dusty, um, and, um, and it would be nice to, you know, enhance these neighborhoods a little bit. Um, but what happens in Mongolia, for example, what people told me and I, what was my experience is that the arts and cultural production mainly take place in the international city center, which is very small. And uh, people living in, in these girl districts don't really have access to, to that kind of arts. And I did meet many artists there that were very um, gifted and very eager to uh, use their work to, for social change in these areas but they just didn't have the, um, the platform to do so and the infrastructure to do so. And, um, and this is where UNIC came in and the European partners and the Mongolian partners, in that case, Goethe Institute, Alliance Française, the Czech Embassy, the National University of Arts in Mongolia and the Mongolian Arts Council came in and started the project Nogambater to uh, enable the artists to, to go to these places and develop art forms that um, bring color, bring joy, and also paint a vision um, of, a, of a different future and of a different environment and tell stories of a different environment. Um, so, so, and without UNIC, that, that wouldn't have happened. And without the collaboration of French and Czech artists with the Mongolian artists, uh, that wouldn't have happened in that way. And um, because I was so, um, so keen on that raising awareness is not the only issue, um, of course, I would like to point out that in this project also, um, it went beyond awareness raising um, by, uh, by putting an example of thermal insulation for people in this community center you see here. So um, it's, it's a community center in one of the Gur districts. And um, in, in the frame of the project, Norman Butter, it was thermally insulated, which helps a lot to, to heat less with coal, to produce less air pollution. And at the same time, it was used as one of the exhibition spaces for the, um, for the art that was being uh, crafted in the, in the Nogambatra festival, thereby attracting people to this model of insulation and um, distributing the knowledge about it. And uh, all that uh, wouldn't have happened without the UNIC project. So I think um, there's great uh, potential in, in these programs and in the international collaboration they cause. Uh, thank you very much. Great, thank you. And it's really interesting, fascinating to find out more about environmental psychology and the connection to, to culture in that it can, it, you can have personal experiences and you can have storytelling that can then have an effect, not just to raise awareness, but change behaviors and for people to start taking action and having a vision of what's possible. So thank you so much for sharing. I'm going to come back to Hayes, um, and then I will be opening up for questions. So thank you for sharing any questions in the chat on our online platform, Confiva. Um, and I will come back to those as soon as uh, I give the floor to Hayes, just to share a bit more about um, what cultural institutes can do to support the cultural dimension of sustainable development and what you learned from your research, um, having taken in this whole conversation with our panelists. And I will just ask Michelle if she could share the, her screen for the slides. Okay, 
they'll come up in a second. So I don't know if Chais, you'd like shall to start. I, shall I, uh, shall I uh, kick off? First of all, um, what a wonderful series of inspiring examples. Um, and uh, it's, it's really a, a delightful panel, I must say, if I may say so, <laughs> as a co-panelist. Wonderful. I hope, uh, I hope lots of European Commission officials are watching this or will be watching this. Um, I'd like to say a few words actually uh, building on the examples about the role of the European Union and taking this whole agenda forward. Uh, what can the EU do? What can national governments do to promote this agenda? Well, first, uh, wh where do we stand? What's the starting point? Uh, what's the baseline? Uh, next slide. Um, as we know, there have been two main international agreements. Could you have the next slide, please, Michelle? I think there may be a problem with if not, uh, slide sharing. It matter. should come up in a minute. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll carry on if you don't mind, uh, not to waste uh, any time. So if we go back a little bit, mm, one more. Yeah, great. Um, so where do we stand? We have two main international agreements, which of course we all know, the Paris Agreement uh, to keep global temperature rise to within one and a half degrees and the Sustainable Development Goals, both agreed in 2015. Huge agendas very, very ambitious agendas, but absolutely necessary agendas. On both of these agenda items, real progress has been made in recent years, but not enough. Um, Guterres uh, a few weeks ago said in terms of the Paris Agreement, we are way off track. At the moment, the world is on an unsustainable path to more than two degrees uh, warming compared to the pre-industrial levels. That's just not uh, where we want to be. And also in terms of the SDGs, a lot of good work has been done and a lot of SDGs are coming within reach, but several are not. And here Europe too has to do a lot better. It's interesting to see that Europe is actually not doing enough uh, on the sustainability side. Uh, SDG 2, no hunger. SDG 12, responsible consumption and production. Uh, 13, climate action and life below water and life on land. That is where Europe is most behind and needs to improve. So what do these agendas mean for culture? Uh, next slide. Basically, in terms of sustainability, we face three main threats to culture. Climate change, the erosion of human rights, and the rise in poverty and inequality based on uh, the results of COVID-19. Climate change, of course, uh, affects natural heritage. Um, a quarter of the world heritage sites are currently under severe threat. But there are also huge risks to cultural heritage. Climate change risks wiping out irreplaceable intangible heritage from the cultural traditions of the Sami and the Inuit uh, in the Arctic to, uh, for example, plant-based medicinal practices in Tibet. There's also huge risk to tangible heritage. Um, Venice comes to mind, but also, for example, the coastal forts and castles in Ghana. Um, increased humidity uh, threatens the 2,000-year-old rock art in Twijfelfontein, Namibia. Uh, and then, of course, uh, there is the indirect effect of climate change on heritage. So take, for example, the, the iconic, um, iconic mud houses in Mali, in Jenne. Uh, where many local people have seen their incomes drop due to crop failures as a result of climate change. And because of that drop in income, they're now forced to rely on cheaper materials that radically change the town's appearance. So climate change. Then uh, I won't go into the detail on human rights because we have a separate panel on it, but uh, it's something that deeply worries me and should be much higher on the European Union's agenda. The rollback in cultural freedom is not high enough on politicians' uh, radar screens. And of course, COVID means an increase in inequality and poverty in the world. Uh, Europe is expected to recover in about three years, but many countries in the global south will take much longer. So the development agenda has really been set back. So what's the EU doing about that in terms of climate change? Well, very briefly, uh, you are familiar with the European Green Deal. Uh, Europe should be climate neutral by 2050. 
and by 2030, we want uh, more than half a reduction in net emissions. For once, the EU has put its money where its mouth is. The budget is huge, unprecedented, 550 billion if you add up all the different instruments and a possibility to rise to about 1 trillion euros if you include the leveraging effect of the EU financial instruments on private uh, investment. The bad news is the European Union did not include the cultural sector in the European Green Deal. It's simply not there. Um, whether that is because the DG for Culture uh, has not managed to convince the DG for Climate, I don't know. But it is a glaring gap. Yes, Mrs. von der Leyen has launched a personal initiative called the European Bauhaus, but that is limited to uh, building better in Europe itself. It does not have a global dimension and it doesn't have a budget. So uh, that brings us to culture. Culture basically has two relations with climate change. It contributes to climate change and it can help solve things. Uh, as Henry has said, it's very important to focus also on the role of culture in contributing to climate change. The cultural sector needs to do more to green itself. Um, I won't go to, through all these examples, but uh, uh, the, the, the visual arts, the festival industry, the film industry have huge carbon footprints. The film industry is uh, a classic example of carbon production, and that is excluding things like waste, water use, etc. Uh, Henry knows everything about the museums, so I won't go into that. But of course, also the European Union National Cultural Institutes have buildings they need to green, and not all European Union cultural institutes have a sustainability policy as their first priority. Last but not least, what can culture do directly? What can cultural organizations do? Well, um, dozens of initiatives, if not hundreds of initiatives worldwide uh, are taking place in different sectors of culture, from the performing arts to the film industry, to the music industry, festival, architectural, visual arts. In each of these sectors and many more, small projects are underway in different countries. What is missing is synergy between them. What is missing is cross-border learning. What is missing is a European approach to culture uh, as a, a contributor to the reduction of carbon footprints. Um, then, as Christian has said and illustrated with his wonderful cigarettes example, uh, there are lots of initiatives to raise public awareness and hopefully behavior. There too, the same applies. Uh, many of these are in different parts of Europe, different parts of the world, they're not connected and mutual learning needs to be developed. So last, finally, what are the missing links? Where should the EU focus its energy? A first point would be to beef up the role of European Union delegations outside Europe to link out to local cultural players and engage them in an agenda of international cultural cooperation. Not in the classic way, top down, the EU giving and others receiving, but on the basis of equality, of partnerships, of uh, give and take on an equal basis. That is what the Sustainable Development Goals are about. SDG 17 is all about partnerships for the goals, not just work that the Global South needs to do, the Global North needs to do as much. So partnerships promoted by the delegations, Second priority would be for the European Commission to make sure it finally brings the cultural sector into the European Green Deal and reaches out to culture in order to achieve that. There's been an excellent report by ICOMOS and Europa Nostra arguing for that. Thirdly, we need at European level, sustainable infrastructure for mutual learning. And one idea would be to have a European platform for cultural and the sustainable development goals where the cultural sector can exchange these practices and learn on a systemic basis. And last but not least, uh, we need finally the European Commission to come up with an action plan. The Council of Ministers has asked this on several occasions, but the European Commission has not responded. It's a strange case where ministers are ahead of the European Commission. It's time for the Commission to pull up its socks and to respond to that invitation, because frankly, climate change 
and the rise in poverty and the problems with human rights require much more EU action. Thank you, Hayes, and all really strong points that you've made there, summing up um, a very important discussion that we're all having here today. So thank you to those who have shared some questions in the chat. Um, and picking up on, Hayes, your latest point around funding and uh, the treaties, how do we have a more equal partnership uh, north-south? How can we learn from each other and strengthen and support each other more? I'd like to come back to Ayeta because this is something you brought up as well. How can we have uh, better funding models, more better treaties that enable sustainability and connections between, uh, in your case, East Africa and uh, Europe? So I wonder whether you would be able to share a few more examples of how we could enable that to happen. Uh, thank you so much, Rosanna, for that question. Um, as part of an ongoing research I was doing actually uh, for the British Council, uh, one of the challenges uh, that uh, some informants uh, raised was the lack of institutional you know, collaboration, you know, treaties, for example, uh, between people, stakeholders in our cultural stakeholders in the global south and the north. So as uh, um, Gaze was saying that you find activities that are not connected because there is no framework that uh, brings us all together. Um, we have think tanks that are not funded by anyone, you know. So the agenda that uh, we set out to do is not supported by anything, not the uh, African Union uh, and uh, uh, not our governments. Uh, so we end up uh, in this situation, uh, which creates an unequal relationship between the North and the South, because we end up looking for all kinds of financing uh, that are available. Uh, but I think that um, even within that kind of setting, there, uh, there's some level of um, equity, you know, that can be created in terms of uh, sharing ideas, like I, I explained. Uh, in my pre presentation about sharing ideas around, you know, how to handle climate change. Uh, this is how we want to do it. And we think we can uh, benefit from the global north through, you know, sharing, uh, accessing information on uh, technological transfer. Uh, yes, uh, Lisa talked about uh, how the cultural sector needs to, you know, address their own, you know, uh, global warming issues, you know, most of those issues are not uh, being discussed in the sector because we are thinking about the more basic issues about survival. And so uh, if your, your role is just about thinking about being a communicator of uh, climate change, and yet you're not thinking about the building that you're really working in, how it's contributing to climate change, that's a critical issue. So for us in Sidea, we've taken some simple you know, measures, for example, in terms of our drinking water. Uh, we do not boil our water, we do not use uh, dispensers. So we have a local technology where we use tap water and uh, we have a ceramic uh, pot that we pour the water in and it sips all the filth and then we can drink water direct from the tap, just like you guys. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> yeah, so the things that we are trying to do to actually say we can use our local knowledge to address uh, climate change, but then there are other things we feel that we can learn from the global north. As I explained, for example, in terms of uh, uh, building, you know, that is really a, a, a policy issue beyond the cultural sector. Now that's within the environment sector, uh, how, you know, the government can be supported to come up with green building codes so that we don't have people building all kinds of houses uh, without any policy that guides them, that even taps into our own cultural heritage about uh, building, because many of our houses uh, traditionally, you know, they were eco-friendly and, uh, you know, but we are moving away from that because we think that it's not modern. And so we need, you know, our new architects to begin 
thinking around green building because sometimes when they show examples about green building, I don't see the green in it. I see, you know, minimal measures that have been taken. Um, so I think um, uh, on the funding level, it's still a challenge for us. Uh, we need uh, cre uh, creative think tanks supported um, so that we can have collaborative research to contribute uh, to the climate change agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you, and you raised some really important points around what can the cultural sector do more to be more sustainable. Um, and I'd quite like to come to you, Christian, uh, with your concrete examples of trying to make this happen. Um, I, how have you found the conversation with cultural actors, whether they're the artists you worked with or the venue organisers for, for your project in Munich, but also um, when engaging with the local communities in Mongolia, how open were they to this sustainability and, and this idea of connecting culture? Uh, thank you, Rosanna. Um, well, uh, in Munich, um, uh, it's, um, it's divided a little bit. So uh, there is a, um, a group of people from culture sectors and um, it's it's uh, finally the music clubs that are um, kind of going forward, some of them. And um, uh, they did a project with us, with us a few years ago on, um, you know, reducing their energy consumption. Um, they threw nights with us um, uh, where uh, all, the, um, all the money they would raise in one club night go towards energy efficiency measures in the club uh, around ventilation and cooling and, you know, very technical um, stuff that is necessary for them to become greener. Um, and uh, that is the very, you know, on the very concrete side of things. Um, on the, on the, uh, the other side of things, cultural productions um, incorporating sustainability more into their, into their, into their work, into the daily work. Uh, I miss mainly in, 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 in mainstream culture and pop culture um, and in classic culture, I kind of miss the um, connection because I, I, I don't really see the role models, the way we live our lives, you know, um, I don't really see the role models in uh, pop culture or classic culture um, promoting new way of, of life because that is ultimately what everything comes, comes down to, policy changes, economic changes, whatever. In the end, it is about changing our lives uh, in a way that they reduce less, less energy and less resources. And we have to experiment with our lifestyles. And I, I, I miss the role models in culture very much, um, like the transport uh, new ideas of what is a good life and what do we want to do in life. Um, yeah. yeah, I think role models and seeing ourselves and, and seeing the relevance of sustainability in our lives um, is where there's often a, an issue. And I think something that Henry, you also mentioned, how, how do we make all of this relevant to us individually? And that can help, um, yeah, the, the personal and the professional side of taking action. Um, so I wondered whether you could share some more examples of best practice of public participation, uh, but also how that public participation can influence policy. Yeah, th thanks for the question, Rosanna, because I think when it comes, then it's like, well, public participation in what? And if we were to think, just to pick on uh, a couple of points which, which Christian and, and Hees had made, that there's a kind of tension often when we talk about climate action and the, the, someone described it to me once as a bit like pushing a stone up a hill. Individuals are encouraged to take on more and more personal climate action in an increasingly unsustainable structure and they just get, it's just very frustrating. So in a way what we need to do is to change the rock and the structure and the relationship and the bit in between. So how we empower people, not just to be the rock, but how we empower them to effect change to the structure. And that's where cultural culture comes in. 
It's about how do people share with one another what their concerns are, their visions for the future, their hopes for the future. How do they um, collaborate in whatever way that is to basically to demand greater ambition and change. So the, one of the great myths with climate change is that um, the public don't want climate action because it means they'll have to change their ways. If we look at some of the big surveys, there was one done for the UN 75 dialogues, there was one done for by, by UNDP maybe last year, over a million people to each survey. They, people want greater climate ambition, they want greater climate action. The, unfortunately, the, the weak link in it is not the UN level or the local level, it's the national level. And so this is, I think, where where cultural institutions come in it's like at what level is change actually does it happen what at what level is can change be affected at a hyper level hyper local individual level there's only so much you can do when it gets to really big countries or so on lots of challenges so there's a there's a suggestion that there's the scale of 10,000 to hundred thousands of people is the scale at which transformational change happens. So what kind of institutions reach tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people? It's cultural institutions. So providing opportunities, absolutely not to be uh, some kind of really old fashioned Victorian, you know, we've got the ideas, we need to be the savior here. It's just to help facilitate the discussion across society. It's just to provide the platform. And so just to pick up on something that Heath had said as well, um, that there was a, uh, there's a UN inquiry at the moment asking about um, public protest, the rights of assembly and association in relation to climate justice. So I put in a submission based on museums to say that we, we need to protect this public space in order to facilitate the public dialogue which the governments have already said is really crucial to addressing climate change. It's actually in their own interest. Um, and so I'm kind of rambling a bit all over the, the place now, but what I would say is there, there's no one size fits all. Um, we need to focus on opportunities um, where people can explore solutions, not problems, and they have to be solutions that, that are solutions for them, not solutions for someone else. Um, but to pick up something from, from what Ayeta had said, we can't just all focus on people being concerned for their, for their own place, because that also is just about selfishness. We need to look at how what we do relates to the bigger picture. And that's, 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 my, that's my thoughts, really. Thank you. So what I've heard from this panel is um, in order for European institutions, but also other actors in the cultural sector in general to, to make transformational change happen. We, we all need to make the SDGs relevant to people, embed it in the way that we, um, we work and the way that we live our lives, and to be part of that change in the structures and the systems that prevent um, transformational change to happen. Um, and I'd just like to come back to Ghais on your provocation around freedom of expression, human rights, because I think that is what we're all saying. Um, in order for climate action to take place, we need those freedoms in place. So how can we connect the Green Deal uh, of the EU and the European Bauhaus Initiative to more international shared um, priorities, such as human rights, to kind of make that connection between sustainability and our way of life. How much time do we have? <laughs> in one <laughs> sentence. <laughs> in, in, I think in one word, visibility. Um, I think it's absolutely essential that people of goodwill start speaking out much more audibly, visibly, dramatically, linking with emotions as Christian has, has so, so powerfully illustrated. Cultural people, are much better at that than many others. But they are often diffident. They are often worried about the short-term future, about the fact that they need to get access to funding to keep their heads above water tomorrow. And then longer-term issues tend to somehow fade into the background, not because they don't want to, but because they don't have the time and the energy and the money. 
But visibility is essential to talk to politicians. If I take my own country, the Netherlands, as an example, there's a lot of opposition, political opposition, against measures to fight climate change. Reduction, for example, in the number of Dutch cows um, is a political no-go. Why? Because the cows are being weaponized by the right, as this is Dutch tradition, and we can't cut our economy uh, for some witchy-washy left-wing uh, climate agenda. If you want to address that type of weaponizing of resistance to the fight against climate change, others have to speak up. Others have to be as visible as the opposition. So that's critical. Finally, what can the EU do? Very, very briefly, uh, echoing a few points I think that Julia Sattler made earlier this morning. One, build more sustainability in funding models. The EU tends to fund two-year projects. That's not enough. If you want to have change, think in terms of three to four years at a minimum. But secondly, reach out to member states. The real money is with national governments, also in development relations with the French and the Germans and the Italians and the Spanish, who all work past each other. Here, the EU has to be much more active to bring them together in synergy. And the third point, which uh, Julia made, I think is essential, the European Commission has to make this whole policy area much more visible. The Commission is underplaying its strength. The European External Action Service has to push harder and the European Commission has to speak out. Mrs. von der Leyen, over to you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I've really enjoyed this panel discussion with you and I'm sure our audience has as well. So. Thanks to all our speakers today and to UNIC and the European Spaces for Culture for making this conversation possible. There'll now be a short break of 15 minutes and then we will reconvene on the same platform for the conference's final session, featuring a keynote by Stefano Sannino, Secretary General for the EEAS, who will offer thoughts on the role of culture in the EU's activity on the global political stage. Um, followed by a discussion with EU Parliament member Salima Yambu, uh, cultural policy expert Kimani Njogo, joining from Kenya, and curator and cultural critic Katerina Botanova and UNIC director Gita Sosh. So in the break, do join back into the plenary room, uh, where we'll be showing the documentary film made by the team of Nogambato, Eco Art Festival and the European Spaces of Culture pilot project in Mongolia. So thanks again to everyone for joining us today and I wish you a very good afternoon. Thank you. Bye bye.